Good morning, everyone, and um, welcome to our Friday morning uh, session. It's going to be a terrific session. Um, but I did want to start off just by putting in a brief comment about the upcoming uh, Virtual World Congress on Thyroid Cancer. Then, obviously, it's going to be a little bit of an unusual format this year, and there are going to be three separate dates um, that are going to be offered. Uh, the first one is coming up in mid-March, and um, then it will move on from there. It's, this is sort of a segue to introduce uh, Dr. Orloff, who will be giving a keynote address on March 13th. Um, I, and listening to her talk this morning is no excuse for uh, not joining in to listen to her again on, um, on the 13th. But with that, I encourage all of you to uh, have an opportunity to, if you can, uh, to join in that um, that day and all the other and the other two, if you um, if you're able to do so. Well, it gives me a pleasure, a great pleasure, to introduce a colleague and friend who has um, spoken in this platform before. Uh, Dr. Lisa Orloff um, is uh, both a colleague and a friend who I've known for. Um, a considerable period of time and have had the great fortune of watching her career blossom um, both on a national and international level. She is the Director of Endocrine Head and Neck Surgery um, Program and Professor um, of Otolaryngology in the Division of Head and Neck Surgery at Stanford. Um, she's also Director of the Stanford Thyroid Tumor Program within the Stanford Cancer Center um, and she focuses almost exclusively on the management of thyroid and parathyroid tumors. As I mentioned, she's internationally recognized as a leader in the field of endocrine head and neck surgery. She's also an expert um, in the field of ultrasonography, which she will be talking about uh, this morning. In particular, she'll be discussing um, uh, its role during a pandemic. Um, and uh, I think it'll be particularly poignant to hear her thoughts on how ultrasonography can keep us safe, um, those of us who are entrusted to uh, be able to examine the upper air digestive tract. Dr. Orloff has had an extremely busy career. Um, she has served as um, the chair of the American Academy of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery Endocrine and Surgery Committee for three straight um, terms. She holds leadership roles in the AHNS, the um, American Thyroid Association, the American Institute of Ultrasound in Medicine and in the American College of Surgeons. Um, and she is co-chair of the American College of Surgeons um, Thyroid, Parathyroid and Neck Ultrasound Training Programs. Um, and so with that, um, I will put one last plug in and that is for her textbook um, on head and neck ultrasonography, which is a, a wonderful uh, resource for all clinicians. Um, so Lisa, um, I could take up uh, the rest of the 45 minutes to 50 minutes uh, talking about you, but I'm going to let you go ahead and um, intervene. And as always, I encourage everyone to um, write in their questions, and we'll try to get to those at the very end here. Well, thank you so much for that kind introduction, Mark. I hope you all can hear me and, and see my screen. And um, by now, I'm, I'm starting to feel like I, I live on the East Coast. These early morning webinars for you are really early for me, so you'll have to pardon my gravelly voice, but I, you're, you're gearing me up for the World Congress on Thyroid Cancer, which is also on, um, on East Coast time. So it's really a pleasure to join you all. And um, I, uh, I have no disclosures, although I appreciate your plug for, for my textbook, which I just want to mention that I have borrowed some images from uh, the second edition of Head and Neck Ultrasonography published by Plural to which you Mark and colleagues and, and perhaps other members of the audience have kindly contributed and um, this is a practical guide to ultrasonography especially for the clinician which I, I don't know who's out there in the audience it's a little bit difficult to, in general to do these talks without being able to interact with you directly but I appreciate all of you who are listening um, tuning in and I hope that this will inspire you to improve your ultrasound skills. So I'm coming to you from Stanford University in California, which actually looks more like this right now. It has, the sun has not yet come up, but um, I uh, want to acknowledge some of my mentors and 
give you just a little bit of a backstory on how I became interested in ultrasonography because it did involve some serendipity, inspiration, and as is always important, collaboration. I started out my academic career at UC San Diego where the chief of ultrasonography, Barbara Gosink, um, grabbed me one day after she had sustained an injury to her neck and she asked me to lend my knowledge of laryngeal anatomy to her skills and knowledge of ultrasonography. And that, that incident, which was back in about 2000, was really an epiphany for me because I had never held an ultrasound transducer before that time and had only seen pictures of ultrasound images that I couldn't make any sense of. And granted, this was in the era where high resolution ultrasound really wasn't as high resolution and high quality as it is today. But uh, seeing uh, the human neck in real time and holding a probe or a transducer and running it over the, the larynx at that time uh, gave me great insight into what we could see and do with ultrasonography and uh, that in an interactive way without any radiation. So I want to also pay tribute to a number of my mentors along the way uh, in the world of ultrasonography. And uh, in this photo, you see in the upper uh, left-hand corner, Peter Yecker and his chairman at the time, Wolf Mann from Mainz, Germany, who graciously hosted me when I did a sabbatical, I was able to obtain a Fulbright scholarship to go to Germany to, uh, for an educational exchange in which I received training in ultrasonography and gave a variety of lectures and did some collaboration in research. But that really launched my head and neck ultrasound career in the office setting. And uh, it was furthered by this gentleman here, Anil Ahuja from Hong Kong, who is just the world's master in head and neck ultrasonography. He's a radiologist, but has published extensively on uh, ultrasound, uh, ultrasound findings of head and neck pathology. Uh, many of you probably know Bob Sofferman, the late Bob Sofferman, who was a champion of ultrasound within the field of otolaryngology and really helped to further the quality of the course of head and neck uh, thyroid, parathyroid, and neck ultrasound that is offered through the American College of Surgeons to clinicians. And this is my group of current colleagues, uh, Hans Welkoborski, Jens, Jens Meyer, and Urban Geistoff. And I have been teaching courses in ultrasound at the American Academy of Otolaryngology for now, I believe, 18 years. So, um, you know, it's a passion of ours. And I think that anybody who gets their hands on an ultrasound transducer and starts to do this in an interactive way will find that they don't want to ever turn back. But uh, finally, Dave Isley was my chairman at UC San Francisco, where he really allowed me to and encouraged me to uh, expand my ultrasonography practice and narrow my focus into endocrine surgery, as Mark said, nearly exclusively. And then, of course, my career-long friend and colleague, Mark Gerken, who has championed not only ultrasonography, but just excellence in head and neck surgery across the a spectrum of uh, head and neck and thyroid oncology care. So I thank all of my mentors in otolaryngology, but also my number one mentor, my mother, Anne Stewart Orloff, who was born on this very day in 1926. And she left us uh, a couple of years ago, but uh, she's in my heart and she was a radiologist. So I think it may come somewhat naturally that I gravitated towards doing something that was akin to what she did with her work. And uh, I miss her dearly, but uh, some of this is inspired by her. So I'll start with uh, what I think uh, most members of the audience probably recognize by now is that ultrasonography is the primary modality for imaging the thyroid gland. And it really is the best way to identify and characterize thyroid nodules as well as diffuse thyroid disease. Ultrasound is routinely used nowadays for guiding biopsies as well as other procedures. We won't go into those very much today, but I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, ultrasound allows for objective monitoring over time and follow-up of thyroid cancer and other disorders. And of course, what we're going to focus on today is assessment of the extrathyroidal neck, but really uh, the thyroid and the rest of the neck uh, go hand in hand. We're also going to talk about dynamic assessment of function and not just static structure. So uh, we wanna focus on the entire landscape of, uh, that the thyroid resides in. 
I want to go a step further and just um, say why I think clinician performed thyroid and neck ultrasonography really adds a, an element that is sometimes lost when the ultrasound exam is separated from the clinician. The, the clinician really can perform real-time ultrasound and simultaneous interpretation with both static and moving structures. The uh, clinician has the greatest knowledge of the patient's presenting complaints, symptoms, history, and physical findings, and is um, looking right at the patient and familiar with the patient's unique anatomy as well as um, surgical anatomy. And uh, the clinician can correlate studies that have been obtained elsewhere, other types of imaging studies, and, and perhaps may be more motivated to do so rather than just say they're not available. An ultrasound guided fine needle aspiration biopsy can be performed at the same time as a diagnostic ultrasound, which is quite, in, uh, quite a convenient aspect of office-based ultrasound. And perhaps as important as anything else is the ability to bond or, or develop rapport and education with the patient as you're doing an ultrasound exam and uh, help plan for surgery when it's appropriate, translating findings to the operating room while at the same time minimizing cost and radiation and, and maximizing cure. So we all know that ultrasonography is very operator dependent and that can be a good or a bad thing, but I think if the operator is motivated and continually uh, acquires new knowledge and skill, the more we know, the more we see, the more we suspect and the more we look for, the more we are able to see. And certainly with ultrasound, the more territory we cover, the more we're going to see. As in all aspects of head and neck surgery, otolaryngology and really medicine, I think attention to detail is paramount. And uh, we are able to do dynamic assessment of structures and function in the, uh, the hands-on practice of ultrasonography which I regret to say that even in this lecture, I'm going to show you some videos, but they don't quite do justice to the actual interactive exam with the patient. So they're the best we can do in a lecture format, but they aren't quite the same as, as being there. So I would propose that the thyroid, thyroid ultrasound exam really should be the neck ultrasound exam, looking at not only the primary tumor or primary source, but all the rest of the structures and the relationships between the thyroid and the anatomy surrounding it. The um, ability to detect direct extension of thyroid disease into the surrounding anatomy, but also extension of the thyroid and uh, related structures, including the larynx and lymph nodes, are, are uh, right at your fingertips, literally. And uh, we often hear mention of lymph node mapping as sort of a follow-up ultrasound exam that's performed after a patient has been diagnosed with thyroid cancer and now is being uh, offered surgery and we want to see if there are lymph nodes uh, that are affected. This is all fine and if you don't have the opportunity or the experience to do ultrasonography, I would highly encourage you to obtain a lymph node mapping type of uh, exam because sadly it has not become standard of care for every ultrasound exam at every institution to include the neck, but hopefully one day we will get there where the thyroid and the neck are considered all one and the same, and that lymph node map mapping can be uh, incorporated into the initial ultrasound exam. Maybe for practical and efficiency purposes, this doesn't always happen, but certainly when a patient um, has either a diagnosis or a suspicion of thyroid cancer, it can be true that the disease is much more obvious or significant within the lymph nodes that drain the thyroid as opposed to the thyroid itself. We've all seen cases of papillary microcarcinoma that have associated prominent and even invasive lymph node metastases. And so um, whether it's one exam or two, lymph node mapping is, is critical in thyroid cancer care. And it's important to understand the neck anatomy. This is a picture borrowed from Dr. Erkin's uh, platform uh, outlining the uh, levels of the neck. If you're not familiar with these, I would refer you to Dr. Erkin's writings, um, including the chapter that he contributed to, to the textbook that I edited, also to the classic Robbins publication on neck dissection classification and levels. But I would put a pitch in that it's my preference, and I see it on Dr. Erkin's graph here, it's his as well, to use Arabic numerals rather than Roman numerals when numbering 
levels of the neck because we've all seen mislabeling of level six as level four and vice versa when Roman numerals are used. And this creates a lot of uh, potential um, misfortune for patients if the wrong compartment is addressed or not addressed. So the problem with thyroid cancer is that it is a, the thyroid gland is a very central gland or organ which has lymphatics that drain in literally 360 degrees of direction and therefore there can be lymph nodes in all compartments of the neck. Lymph node metastases from thyroid cancer are present in up to 90% of cases depending on how hard you look for them. Now of course not all of these metastases are clinically important but uh, it does speak to the early and perhaps less um, ominous occurrence of lymph node metastases in thyroid cancer compared to other cancers in other organs. But uh, the central compartment is classically defined as extending from the hyoid bone superiorly to the innominate artery inferiorly, and it therefore includes nodes in the delphian or prelaryngeal location, the paratracheal space on either side, and the pretracheal space, which uh, overlaps between right and left level six of the neck. And as you can see, this compartment is somewhat disjointed because you have a thyroid in between, and it's not always possible to dissect the entire central compartment in one continuous uh, packet. The lateral compartments of the neck are divided into levels one through five. And we have classic landmarks on CT and cross-sectional imaging that denote the boundaries between these compartments but we have to use slightly different landmarks in ultrasound because of different structures that are visible. So whereas the hyoid bone is typically considered the, the boundary between level two and three on CT, we consider the carotid bifurcation to be that same uh, demarcation between level two and three on ultrasound. Further, the omohyoid crossing the internal jugular vein denotes the boundary between level three and four whereas the cricoid cartilage is that boundary on um, CT imaging. And when we're doing an ultrasound exam of the entire neck, it really doesn't matter what sequence one uses, but it, I would encourage uh, practitioners to develop their own algorithm so as not to miss any portions of the neck. I find it easiest to start in the central neck with the thyroid and the associated lymph nodes in the central compartment but also to include ascending through the larynx and all the way up, not only to the hyoid bone, which is technically the limit of le level six, but even up to the base of tongue, where there may be a thyroglossal duct uh, remnant at the foramen cecum. The lateral compartments of the neck can be scanned from down to up or up to down, but um, no matter how you scan the neck, because the size of the ultrasound transducer is narrower than the width of the neck, and this is a necessity in order to follow the contours and convolutions of the neck, but uh, I find it easiest to, to start at the, at the inferior aspect, scanning from levels four through three and two, and then sort of doing a lawn mowing type of back and forth motion to get over the entire posterior neck in level five, and then finish up in level one. But there's, there's really no right or wrong way. Most of us scan in a transverse plane for the majority of the exam, but then use sagittal imaging as well as Doppler imaging to corroborate and interrogate structures and to obtain three-dimensional measurements. It's important to save still and video clip images so that others can see your exam findings and you can refer back to your own exam findings. And uh, this entire exam really doesn't take very long. So it is a, a fact that ultrasound is not going to save time in your day-to-day -day clinic practice, but it will, um, it will certainly enhance the quality of your care and the majority of the time spent really is in the reporting and documentation, I find, but uh, that can be uh, tailored to the per particular situation. So the exam is done typically with the patient supine, um, somewhat in the operative position, but with their head uh, supported, but um, their neck extended as much as comfortably possible. It helps to use a lot of ultrasound gel and interact with the patient, having them turn their head right and left throughout the exam to uh, look at different structures. One can ask the patient to perform different maneuvers such as swallowing, moving the tongue, chewing, phonating, and uh, using the examiner's non-transducer bearing hand to palpate the neck while doing the exam is very helpful as I will show 
shortly. The central neck includes the paratracheal nodes, as I mentioned, which are um, very um, commonly affected in thyroid cancer. This is the same region that we use to scan for parathyroid disease and uh, parathyroid adenomas or hyperplastic glands. The prelaryngeal or delphian nodes uh, are typically superior to the thyroid isthmus, sometimes overlapping the isthmus or the pyramidal lobe though. And then the pretracheal and superior mediastinal nodes are accessible inferiorly. Moving on up to the larynx as part of the central neck, it is within the central compartment, but going further and identifying whether there are thyroglossal duct cysts or lingual thyroid remnants, these are simply done all at the same time. And here's a video which shows descending through the central neck from the thyroid isthmus down to the level of the innominate artery, coursing across here. Can you see my pointer? I don't know if you all can see my pointer as well, but um, the uh, innominate artery typically coming in from the patient's right side and the innominate vein uh, on the left side. Going the reverse direction, ascending from the thyroid isthmus up through the cricoid cartilage, then through the larynx. And then to examine the larynx, it's helpful to reduce the frequency, as you can see here, to get better penetration of sound and observe vocal fold movements. And simply ask the patient to stop breathing or valsalva to see closure or adduction of the vocal folds, you can ask the patient to phonate and then continuing on up through the hyoid bone to the base of the tongue, where if there were a thyroglossal duct cyst, this is where you would see it either in the infrahyoid or suprahyoid region. But you can see here, just asking the patient to wiggle their tongue, it's easy to recognize the contours of the tongue. Now descending through the right side of the central compartment in the right paratracheal space, we start at the thyroid, sweep down through the thyroid, and I like to use this maneuver to follow the carotid artery all the way down to its convergence with the subclavian artery to confirm that this patient has normal nerve anatomy. A small percentage, perhaps 1% or less of patients have a retroesophageal subclavian artery and therefore a non-recurrent laryngeal nerve. And that would be an important thing to know ahead of time if you're going to plan surgery. On the left side of the central compartment, scanning from Superior to inferior, we start here at the top of the thyroid, scan through the thyroid. This patient has a lovely normal thyroid. We see the esophagus. We see the thymus come into view here, which in the adult is somewhat fatty or atrophic, but we get all the way to the nominate vein. And you can even see the aortic arch here at the bottom of the screen. So how much you see really depends on how, how far you go and how, how much you look for. The lateral neck is somewhat easier to detect lymph nodes even in the presence of the thyroid. And as I mentioned, my preference is to start in the carotid sheath and uh, jugular vein drainage. Uh, levels four, three, and two are um, all in a row, and levels five and one are somewhat out of plane and require extra effort to go posteriorly and anteriorly. But here's a video clip ascending through a normal neck from level four at the confluence or innominate artery coming up, you'll see a very small normal lymph node along the way right here. And coming further up to the carotid bifurcation, and you'll see a much larger lymph node in level two, which is entirely normal. You get up to the submandibular gland and the parotid gland. And if you're interested in salivary gland pathology, you can certainly incorporate these structures into your exam. Moving posteriorly, this is a scan of the level five region. And there are not as many landmarks in level five, but you have the trapezius at the far left side of the screen as your posterior border. You're overlying the scalene muscles and levator scapulae muscle. You have a view of the transverse processes of the spine, but uh, if there is pathology, you will see lymph nodes in this region. And otherwise, it all looks somewhat amorphous, but just like a bunch of muscle. Level one, shown here on the right side, the largest structure is the submandibular gland, which has an appearance somewhat similar to the thyroid gland. It has a nice fine-grained uh, parenchyma, but uh, sweeping superiorly, you can see that lymph nodes in level one tend to be a little bit rounder and uh, can be seen all the way up to the mandible. If you manage patients with thyroid cancer who have received radioactive iodine, it's not unusual to have patients with salivary gland complaints. And, you can often see atrophy or even obstruction of, of the salivary glands and can, can help 
direct therapy for those types of side effects. Going to the left side of the neck, again, ascending from level four, actually descending, I'm sorry, this is descending in level four where you see the thoracic duct entering into the internal jugular vein as it dumps into the innominate vein. And this is a dilated thoracic duct, which can be very important to be mindful of when, when looking at lymph nodes in this area or planning surgery. So I was asked to speak in particular about lymph nodes in the neck. And the benign lymph node has a, a variety of characteristics that are summative and help uh, reassure us that they are in fact benign. They tend to be more oval or flattened. They tend to have a visible hilum, which is this hyperechoic, somewhat linear structure in the core of the lymph node through which blood vessels uh, enter and exit. The lymphatics enter the node through the uh, periphery of the node into the germinal centers, and the germinal centers make up the more hypoechoic uh, body of the lymph node. Normal lymph nodes tend to be somewhat homogeneous in their hypoechogenicity and have a high, uh, hyler pattern of vascular flow on Doppler. They tend to be smooth bordered. They tend to be small, although in level two, they can be quite large and still be normal. And they tend to be somewhat more singular rather than clumped together. Here's a uh, video of just the very low flow in the hilum of a lymph node. And I just um, use this in part to remind me to mention that many lymph nodes do not have a visible hilum and yet are normal. So the absence of a hilum is not automatically a cause for alarm or concern that a node is malignant, especially small lymph nodes. It may not be possible to see the hilum. And even with Doppler, it may not be possible to see hilar flow. But certainly when you do see it, it's reassuring. Now, in contrast, lymph node metastases from, from thyroid cancer or from head and neck cancers can uh, have quite a, a different appearance. And again, the accumulation of criteria that are abnormal increase one's suspicion of malignancy. Firstly, lymph nodes tend to become more rounded in shape as opposed to oval. They tend to lose that visible hilum. They tend to, in papillary thyroid cancer, but also in HPV-related squamous cell cancer, become cystic. And in papillary cancer, tend to be hyperechoic or have this sort of uh, grainy parenchymal type of characteristic within the lymph node. On Doppler, they tend to have peripheral vascularity and have irregular borders. They can be much larger than normal and be matted together. And then they can show extranodal extension with invasion into adjacent structures, including even the jugular vein as, as uh, shown here. Here's a video sweeping from level four up through level two on the right. And you can see the carotid artery in the center of the screen. The jugular vein is somewhat flattened, but you'll see a variety of lymph nodes come into view that are rounded, lack a hilum, are thickened, are somewhat hyperechoic. These are classic metastatic papillary carcinoma nodes. And this exam is really uh, easily done very quickly initially, and then you can slow down to interrogate or measure particular lymph nodes, but it's really getting the big, big picture that's um, so helpful. Here's a pediatric patient with a diffuse sclerosing variant of papillary carcinoma extending throughout the thyroid gland, but descending through the central neck, you see numerous metastatic lymph nodes. And then this is just a nice example of a pediatric thymus. So that is not microcalcifications in a lymph node, but that's the thymus gland and uh, a bunch of metastatic nodes next to it. Isthmus cancers really scare me because the thyroid isthmus is so thin and has very little margin between it and the trachea posteriorly or the strap muscles anteriorly. So tumors can be quite small and still uh, escape the thyroid or invade beyond the thyroid early. Here's a sagittal view of an, a small isthmus carcinoma. And when you see this, you should especially be mindful to look in the superior and inferior directions. Here's a pre-laryngeal, um, I'm sorry, a pre-tracheal lymph node just inferior to the isthmus in the midline seen on sagittal view here. And likewise, moving superiorly, these Delphian lymph nodes can be somewhat flattened, but they can be visible in the pre isthmic space as well as the cricothyroid space. And this is an example of that concept I mentioned of sonopalpation, where you can use your non-transducer bearing hand to palpate the patient and their pathology while you're examining them. And um, 
see whether the structures move with relation to each other. This patient was referred to me for a laryngectomy for what was thought to be invasive thyroid cancer on CT scanning. They had a pyramidal lobe papillary carcinoma, and it was really, it looked like it was invading the larynx on CT scan. I'm gonna just play that video again because you can see with sonopalpation, this tumor freely moves with respect to the laryngeal cartilage. If you're, you're pushing it with your left hand while you're scanning with your right, you can see it sliding over the laryngeal cartilage. So the patient was tremendously relieved to find that she did not need a laryngectomy, but simply a um, direct resection. So there are specific benefits of ultrasound, particularly in thyroid cancer, such as some of the examples I mentioned here, raising awareness and suspicion of extrathyroidal extension, of lymph node metastases, of uh, helping to guide and plan uh, the operative uh, course of treatment. Ultrasound does not supplant intraoperative assessment and use of frozen section, but it can help to prepare at the outset whether a lateral neck dissection should be planned. It can suggest whether a central neck dissection should be planned, but it doesn't rule out that possibility based on intraoperative findings because we know that especially large bulky thyroid glands and thyroid tumors can obscure the view of the, of the uh, lymph nodes in the central compartment. But um, in spite of its lack of perfection, ultrasound is more accurate than any other imaging modality for predicting extrathyroidal extension, multifocality, and lateral neck lymph nodes. The central nodes are variable, and uh, we do know that ultrasound fails in certain regions, including retro uh, pharyngeal uh, spaces, space behind air-filled and bony structures. And with some maneuvering and manipulation of the transducer, you can still navigate behind some of these areas by having the patient turn their head, you can get to part of the retropharynx. But um, when in doubt, it's of course still appropriate to order cross-sectional imaging when disease is extensive or invasive. So some, some findings that I've noticed over the years of examining neck lymph nodes is that they are not all created equal Lymph nodes in different compartments of the neck have different appearances. Level two lymph nodes can be very large and juicy and can have big hilum or hyla and still be non-pathologic. Level one lymph nodes uh, defy the rule of a round shape being ominous because they tend to be rounded and tend to have a thicker hilum. On, on, in contrast, level four lymph nodes, especially on the left, tend to be more amorphous and almost amoeba-like, especially in the region near the thoracic duct. Level five lymph nodes usually do lack a visible hilum, and that's not necessarily a bad sign. If you see a lot of level six lymph nodes, think of Hashimoto's thyroiditis because these are often seen in conjunction with Hashimoto's and don't always indicate metastatic disease. And there's internal consistency within a given patient. Uh, some patients have nodes with very thin linear hyla. Other patients' lymph nodes, maybe because of their total body fat or, or just uh, the development of their lymph nodes, have thick hilum uh, uh, structure. And it can be very helpful to look at multiple lymph nodes within the same patient to reassure oneself that a thick hilum is just their norm as opposed to presence of parenchyma within that lymph node. So I encourage you to scan bilaterally to compare right and left sides and um, better recognize pathology from normal. There are post-operative changes that one can be aware of in the post-treatment neck and uh, post-radiation changes as well. And it helps to remember these things when scanning the neck. There are things such as absence of the jugular vein or a jugular vein stump. A big one that's often the case after a neck dissection is an omohyoid stump that may look like a mass, but is just the remnant of muscle. You can see surgical clips that may be misinterpreted for microcalcifications. You uh, may see ligated blood vessels that look like nodular structures. There are radiation changes that are often apparent and the like. And um, I do uh, just mention that there's a high incidence of, um, or higher than I ever realized, incidence of incidental uh, thyroglossal duct cysts, which can help explain sometimes when radioactive iodine is present on a, on a nuclear scan high in the neck. Um, and is not necessarily associated with metastasis. So lymph nodes can be false positive or false negative for a variety of reasons. When they're too small to characterize, when there's minimum of blood flow present, when nodes are long, skinny, or flat, yet they still harbor metastatic papillary carcinoma within a portion of the node, 
when they're round yet reactive, like I said in level one. You have to look for them and you have to go high and low and lateral to, to not miss nodes. It can be difficult when the patient's neck is not sufficiently exposed or extended. So that uh, is important in the setup in the office setting or in the radiology suite. Obese patients are more difficult to examine in the uh, lymph node context. And uh, granulomatous inflammation can look like microcalcifications. Um, we also have to remember the possibility of second primary or uh, second primary metastatic disease or primary uh, lymph node malignancy in addition to thyroid malignancy. I'm not going to belabor fine needle aspiration biopsy as an adjunct to diagnostic ultrasonography because I think most members of the audience probably are aware of the utility of ultrasound guidance for FNA. Uh, but we can also use ultrasound guidance for other procedures. Again, we're not going to get into some newer non-surgical modalities, but uh, one procedure that I find very helpful is intraoperative uh, tumor localization with methylene blue dye injection at the time of surgery, especially in the revi revision neck dissection setting. I use methylene blue. Colleagues uh, at the Institute Gustav Rusi and elsewhere use charcoal suspe suspension, which can be injected several days prior to the uh, neck dissection operation as opposed to in the operating room. But uh, this is just an example of a patient who'd had a prior neck dissection for very extensive metastatic papillary thyroid carcinoma. This is a, uh, a, an image on the right side of the screen, I'm sorry, the, uh, the left side of the screen with the uh, patient's pleura or apex of the lung at the lower left portion of the image and a metastatic node inferior to the subclavian artery, which was responsible for a persistent elevation of serum thyroglobulin. This had been missed during the original neck dissection. I take responsibility for that. I did the original neck dissection, and, and I, I have to say that doing ultrasound, I do find it frustrating that I can see nodes in places where I knew I was there during my dissection, and I believe that after opening up fascial compartments, nodes do shift up to appear in places where they weren't visible on the preoperative ultrasound, but suddenly there they are in the postoperative ultrasound, and it can be frustrating. But this was a really low um, level four slash seven node that uh, harbored papillary carcinoma. And this image on the right side shows uh, injection of just one tenth of a cc of methylene blue at the time of surgery to tattoo this node and make it easier to recognize and retrieve in the revision setting. You'll see in just a second here, the needle is entering into the node and there'll be just a little blush indicating the injection of the methylene blue. And uh, as I said, this is particularly useful in the revision setting. There's the blush right there. And it doesn't take much, really one tenth of one cc is sufficient. But uh, here is the, node itself that was right up against the lung, sorry, the lung apex, inferior to the subclavian artery with a little bit of adjacent tissue to be sure that there weren't additional metastatic nodes. And uh, this can help save time when trying to dissect through dense scar. It also helps to verify that the node that you remove is the node that you intended to remove because you saw it on ultrasound, you targeted it, and then you saw that it was bluish stained in the um, in the 3D virtual uh, or a uh, technicolor uh, intraoperative finding. Um, I would just caution that this technique I have found not to be useful for parathyroid adenomas because of the extensive venous drainage that parathyroid adenomas have. If you inject methylene blue into a parathyroid adenoma, you will get blue staining in the entire regional field, and this can be actually counterproductive and obscure the recurrent laryngeal nerve. So. I don't use it for parathyroids, but for lymph node metastases or tumor nodules, it can be very helpful. Here's another example of a patient with multiple studying uh, nodules. Some of these were probably lymph nodes. Some might have just been tumor deposits. And um, this is post-op central neck. Again, trying to just help identify these and uh, injecting a little bit of methylene blue. You'll see a, a blush right here or an expansion of that area to help uh, identify the boundaries of the uh, the pathology, and this is what you see intraoperatively. So that can be very helpful. I think I'm going to.
skip forward on the, some of the review of the literature just in the interest of getting to uh, a little bit of time to talk about the larynx, but uh, just a couple more examples here of pathology to help you recognize. Practice makes perfect. Here is a lymph node posterior to the carotid sheath, which could be easily missed because it is somewhat similar in appearance to the um, scalene muscle. So I have an arrow with the same exact video shown here. If you tune in posterior to the jugular vein, you'll see some microcalcifications in that lymph node. And that was a uh, retro jugular uh, metastatic uh, lymph node. Ascending through the, a very large primary tumor, and then just seeing how the lymph node metastases often take, take on the characteristics of the primary tumor and have a similar appearance. Lymph node metastases can be rounded, can lack a hilum, can be very vascular with peripheral or disorganized vascularity, can show microcalcifications, as I said, can be rounded without a hilum. It's important to report the location of these very accurately. This is an example of a patient who had an ultrasound done in a radiology department that they mentioned that there was a suspicious node at the base of the neck, whatever that means. And the surgeon performed a beautiful 18 lymph node lateral neck revision dissection and none of the lymph nodes contained cancer and this node was left behind uh, because they didn't have really a good sense of that it was in low level four. So I, uh, I, I wanna, as I mentioned, spend a little bit of time talking about laryngeal evaluation with ultrasonography um, because it is a more recently recognized adjunct to neck ultrasonography. And I did um, offer this publication as part of your uh, reading list. Um, just, it's a very simple short treatise on the value of laryngeal evaluation during COVID-19 to minimize the need to perform uh, aerosol generating procedures or use precious uh, personal protective equipment um, when the exam may be of uh, uh, less need to assess vocal fold structure, but more vocal fold function. Uh, we all know that laryngoscopy is the gold standard for assessing vocal fold pathology and laryngeal structure and uh, subtle changes in mucosal uh, findings and even submucosal findings. And these are laryngoscopic views but we can assess dynamic function of the larynx with ultrasonography quite easily when we're in the ultrasound setting. Here's just an example of symmetric vocal fold motion during uh, a normal exam. This is asking the patient to perform a valsalva maneuver to adduct the vo vocal folds or vocal cords maximally. And uh, it's easiest to recognize this type of uh, finding in the female patient who has a more obtuse larynx with um, less shadowing of the intralaryngeal structures. Male patients in general are more difficult to examine, especially adult males with more pointy or um, prominent thyroid uh, cartilage and even with calcification. But the laryngeal ultrasound exam is just done as part of the um, the the neck exam. The lights are on in this image just to show you what's going on, but you want to be in a darkened room. You adjust the settings on the ultrasound machine to reduce the frequency to improve uh, penetration of the sound into the larynx. You may need to increase the gain, and you, you need to tilt the probe to find the vocal folds. You could ask the patient to phonate very briefly or just to stop breathing. Um, or to perform a valsalva maneuver if they know what that is. Um, you can ask them to swallow and all of these maneuvers will result in movement of the vocal folds. Phonation is actually more difficult to visualize because the larynx tends to tilt as well as uh, show adduction of the vocal folds. So just watching quiet respiration can be really um, the easiest way to examine the larynx, but then uh, just asking the patient to stop breathing or think about speaking uh, results in some adduction of the vocal folds. So um, here's a uh, video again of normal phonation, seeing the vocal folds adduct and then abduct with respiration in between phonation. Depending on how you tilt the transducer, you can get a glimpse of the actual free edge of the vocal folds. And there are uh, numerous recent publications on the use of translaryngeal or transcutaneous laryngeal ultrasound. 
Um, this is one example from Hong Kong. This group has published a number of studies on laryngeal ultrasound and points out that older patients with calcified laryngeas, uh, male patients, and patients who are taller in height tend to have taller uh, and steeper laryngeas, um, may have unaccessible vocal folds. You can sometimes see one vocal fold at a time, um, looking left and then right. Of course, this does not allow you to compare symmetry, but it can at least help you detect motion. But uh, this particular publication pointed out then that when vocal fold motion was considered uh, abnormal or even suspicious for paralysis, it was uh, not always verified on laryngoscopy. So I think it's true that uh, you can see muscular movements in the vocal folds that are not necessarily equivalent to purposeful adduction or abduction of the vocal fold. And you can see asymmetries that may not be as clinically relevant. For those in the audience who are not otolaryngologists and not accustomed to seeing the laryngeal exam on endoscopy, this is an example of a right vocal fold paralysis or immobility with intact mobility of the left vocal fold as seen through a fiber optic scope and sniffing results in abduction here. And then the corresponding uh, exam on ultrasound. This is a male patient where it's somewhat difficult. There's a lot of shadowing and artifact here, but you can see that there's movement of this left focal fold and absence of movement on the right side. And one uh, trick that can help to improve visibility of the larynx if if it's difficult to make contact with the larynx because of the contour of the cartilage and the lack of soft tissue over it, is to put a gel pad or even a, a fluid-filled uh, water balloon or a glove, uh, just an exam glove filled up with water to create a uh, fluid barrier over the skin and then do ultrasound through that to help make better contact with the larynx. And you can see a little bit better uh, the immobility of the right vocal fold with mobility of the left vocal fold. You can see a little bit of movement of the right vocal fold with intraarytenoid motion, but there's not purposeful adduction. Here's just another example to show incomplete vocal fold paralysis. This patient's left focal fold is moving well. The right focal fold has some contraction, but not complete adduction. And here on this right side of the screen during Valsalva maneuver, you see just a different degree of adduction, but the left focal fold is less active than the right focal fold. So, again, on endoscopy, a uh, patient with subtle Asymmetry, the, the tip off here is the different position of the arytenoid cartilage, but the vocal folds have asymmetric motion. There's more ab abduction or separation of the vocal folds, but less uh, complete adduction. And this same patient on ultrasound, you can, uh, you can see varying degrees of mobility. So you, you know that there still is innervation of this vocal fold. But uh, when in doubt, the gold standard is still to perform uh, laryngoscopy. Uh, but this can be just a, a very quick and simple procedure performed at the time of thyroid examination. Now, it's difficult to see into the larynx, but uh, that's my telling me I'm running long. But um, it, 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 the uh, air column in the airway makes, it, uh, makes ultrasound less effective in the lumen of the airway. But here's an example of a patient with an invasive tumor into the laryngeal cartilage. And you can at least get a slight sense of tumor, um, lack of a clear interface between the tumor and the thyroid cartilage. And so it certainly would be a, um, an indication to, to obtain cross-sectional imaging. Again, just uh, comparing a preoperative and a postoperative laryngeal exam, if you've captured the images with video clips, you can assess for uh, any change between the preoperative and postoperative setting. And this, this patient had intact laryngeal function, had intact laryngeal uh, nerve monitoring data. And uh, during COVID-19, we have reduced dramatically our use of fiber optic laryngoscopy where ultrasonography provides an excellent view of the larynx. So here's a, an example of a tumor 
invading the trachea and it's not easy to see the exact extent of the tumor, but you have to have a level of suspicion in order to then obtain cross-sectional imaging and find that indeed uh, there was bulky tumor in the airway. So to summarize, I think I've perhaps beat it to death, but I, I want to emphasize that neck ultrasonography is so much more than just examination of the thyroid. It provides phenomenal assessment of lymph node presence, uh, architecture, suspicion for malignancy or other changes, and really what you see does depend on what you look for. Ultrasound is a dynamic exam that is, enables assessment of dynamic function. And the best way to improve the diagnostic value of ultrasound is to practice it and to seek feedback and correlate your ultrasound findings with other imaging studies, findings that uh, were obtained from the surgical procedure, pathology results, and then follow up ultrasound after the fact. So um, I hope this will inspire you all to get started on uh, doing ultrasound. These were my kids quite a few years back, but uh, it, uh, it's, there's something for everyone in ultrasonography. And um, with that, I hope there's a little bit of time for questions if anybody has any. And uh, again, thank you, Dr. Erkin and team for the opportunity to present today. Lisa, that was uh, absolutely awesome, and I'd be remiss if I didn't um, uh, take up uh, Amy Chen's um, acknowledgement that it is five o'clock on the West Coast, and you're getting up at that hour to be as um, eloquent and as lucid uh, um, is uh, <laughs> truly remarkable. So we have uh, forwarded um, information regarding our Starbucks account at uh, <laughs> uh, for the foundation, and you can just go over there and um, uh, just ask um, uh, for a uh, whatever your favorite uh, beverage is. Um, <laughs> so, so, so talk to me. Just um, maybe you can just talk a little bit about um, on the reporting of laryngeal movements and um, whether you foresee that this is going to be a part of standard reporting for ultrasonography of the neck. Is there a movement um, to incorporate that? Boy, I wish there were. I don't think it's really in the mindset of the radiologist just yet. It's definitely been embraced by the non-otolaryngologist clinician who wants to have a, a way to assess the larynx without having to refer the patient to an otolaryngologist for a, a laryngoscopy. So I think uh, endocrine surgeons, endocrinologists who don't routinely perform laryngoscopy have uh, started recognizing and using this. Um, I, I think that uh, reporting itself has a long way to go to be standardized. And the part of the issue is that the CPT code for neck ultrasound, there's only one CPT code and it is abysmally reimbursed and that is a big deterrent to people embracing doing ultrasound because you're never going to get rich doing ultrasonography and for the time it takes to do a good ultrasound exam, uh, it doesn't generate many RVUs, but it really is best practice and good patient care and it doesn't take extra time to do a look, to make, take a look at the larynx. But the, the CPT code 76536 does not have any kind of quota on what structures need to be assessed or documented. The CPT code description is just real-time ultrasound of the neck with image uh, capture. And that leaves the field wide open as to what one documents and even what one looks for. And that's, that's a problem. Great. Can, can you um, comment on... Uh, give me a rough estimate of what percentage of vocal cords um, you're able to visualize confidently or and which therefore you have to convert to perform a fiber optic? Yeah, I, I would say it's probably 85 or 90 percent of the time um, we can see movement and um, assess symmetry. And the, the patients that are most difficult, as I mentioned, are the adult male patients with a very uh, prominent thyroid cartilage. Um, I still uh, perform laryngoscopy on any patient I suspect of invasive disease, any patient with voice or laryngeal uh, complaints, including dysphagia. But um, it really is uh, remarkable. The more you do it, the more you become comfortable with maneuvering, and, and uh, it's it's a majority of patients that you can you can see uh, movement. Now, as I mentioned, this doesn't mean that you can see changes in the mucosa. So patients may have 
inflammation, edema, um, and you can't assess the diameter of the airway, which is something that I think I think is also very important. So um, that's uh, I, I, I'm not proposing that this replace fiber optic or uh, stroboscopic evaluation, but it, it is a majority of patients that you can see. And um, as I said, reducing the frequency on the ultrasound transducer really helps to get that better view um, into the larynx. Great. Um, how well can you assess um, additional vocal cord pathology aside from um, uh, movement or um, impaired movement? So there's, uh, there's a, a chapter in my book that was actually um, contributed by uh, John Rubin and colleagues from, from England with a, a beautiful example of how what you look for uh, really dictates what you see. And you can get down to the very subtle detail of the larynx if you have time and patience and understand vocal fold structure and uh, pathology. It's possible to see uh, vocal fold cysts, lesions on the surface of the vocal folds. If you have high frequency transducers, it's possible to, um, to see uh, more detail. There's endoscopic ultrasound that can be performed. There's uh, ability to see some laryngeal pathology by doing uh, esophageal ultrasound, which we know now is available through com combination with uh, fiber optic scopes for esophagoscopes. But, uh, I, I would say that we have such wonderful optics and um, equipment uh, with uh, fiber optics that that's still the gold standard for, for mucosal disease in the larynx. Great. Um, with one, one final question here, um, and this really relates to the ability to predict um, pathology based on ultrasound findings. Obviously, lymph nodes and um, E and E and ETE are um, give us clues as to what we might be up against and what um, the biologic behavior is. Um, do you have any level of confidence of predict of identifying um, necrosis as a indication of dedifferentiation of a, a well differentiated of otherwise well differentiated thyroid malignancy? Um, is that something that you would feel comfortable commenting on based on ultrasound findings? That's a good question. Um, I think it's challenging in part because we know that papillary thyroid carcinomas at least have frequent uh, cystic metastases. And whether cystic changes in a lymph node represent uh, just that, just cyst fluid versus necrosis can be difficult to distinguish. But uh, like most things in ultrasound, the level of suspicion of uh, invasive or aggressive disease is somewhat a, a cumulative process of assessing multiple criteria, including hypoechogenicity, irregular borders, invasion into adjacent anatomy, um, heterogeneity within a primary tumor as well as a lymph node metastasis, um, increased vascularity. All of these things um, can sort of suggest dedifferentiation maybe as much if not more than necrosis, which would usually be recognized more as a li liquefaction or um, very hypoechoic change. So um, it may be easier to see that in the primary tumor, the lymph node metastases, um, it's, it's hard to distinguish cystic from necrotic, I think, but it's, it's sort of that summation of characteristics that gives an impression of more aggressive disease. Certainly anaplastic thyroid carcinomas look horrible on ultrasound and um, you know they have all of those things they're very invasive they are poorly defined and um, usually large and heterogeneous and hypoechoic so um, I guess I, I associate those types of criteria with more dedifferentiated tumors in general. Awesome great my final question and, and we're going to let everybody go any any idea how long methylene blue will um, stick around within a lymph node after injection? Um, I think it's uh, safe to say that it sticks around for at least uh, a few hours after injection uh, based on just personal experience. When you infuse methylene blue in the bloodstream, uh, it uh, dissipates after about two hours. 
um, we've used methylene blue to help highlight parathyroid glands through um, systemic uptake. Um, but that's also parathyroid glands that have venous drainage that washes out. Lymph nodes, by their nature, tend to capture things and hold on to them. So um, when, when I've injected nodes, they've uh, been visible as blue uh, several hours into a case. And I don't know what the, what the maximum duration is, but as I mentioned, if you want to inject even days before, then uh, the uh, charcoal suspension can be done in a radiology or office-based setting several days uh, to even a week or more before surgery and still be retained. And I think it's sort of the nature of lymph nodes to retain these things. So I would guess that methylene blue probably lasts longer than even I'm aware. Great. Awesome. Lisa, I can't thank you enough. This was just a, a brilliant presentation on behalf of everybody. Thank you for um, an incredibly educational hour. Um, to everyone, uh, thank you for joining us. Everybody stay safe, and we look forward to uh, seeing you again next week. Thanks again, Thank everyone. Thanks so much. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.